Welcome to our, our, at least in name only, our, our fall meeting. It's, it's, a, it's a hot summer day out there, but thank you all for being with, here, with us here tonight. Um, on behalf of VCSQI, um, we'd like to recognize a number of new faces that we have out in the crowd this evening. Um, you know, I think we did a show of hands earlier for our new guests, but wanted to specifically uh, single out a couple, a couple new folks, uh, Charlene Montague and um, and I'm sorry, I, I, I lost your name. Would you mind? Bobby Bogave. Uh, Bobby Bogave, a cardiologist from Bon Secours, our, our two new uh, faces in the crowd tonight. So just wanted to, to welcome you both. Sorry for uh, putting you on, a, on the spot here, but um, just wanted to get, extend a warm VCSQI welcome. And um, to everyone in the crowd tonight, uh, we've got an exciting agenda uh, with a number of, of updates from our VCSQI strategic plan. And then we'll, we'll really launch into a, a data-driven program this evening as, as our mission of improving the quality of healthcare through, uh, through collaborative analytics. So with that, I will introduce our group's chairman, uh, Dr. Alan Spear from Nova Heart and Vascular. Dr. Spear will provide an update from our board of directors. Thank you. Good evening, and let me also welcome our new uh, participants and members, and thank you for being with us. <clears throat> Just a couple of items. The first is uh, we had a, a, a great uh, meeting today uh, during the middle of the day with the Virginia, um, Virginia Heart, Virginia Health Information. Virginia Health Information. Obviously, you see how overwhelmed I was. This is a, a <laughs> group that was had been in place for 26 years. It is a data uh, information uh, uh, collection uh, that is really exciting and. Uh, as you know, we've been struggling in looking at the, the entire spectrum and the aggregate of care delivery, and particularly with cardiology, since so many have moved, uh, about 70% of, of caths are outpatient, uh, and we have really no access heretofore with outpatient data. This is what this group does. They've got 2.2 billion data elements that we have access to, and uh, we've had a, a very thoughtful uh, uh, discussion at the board meeting and having our cardiologists uh, and administrators get together and looking specifically at how we will query uh, those data and what they can provide for us. It's about a two to three week turnaround and looking at the ambulatory uh, uh, cost. Uh, it is not uh, spe specific uh, to the patients by patient identifiers. So the construct that we've had with combining clinical outcomes to that episode of care, UBO4 of financial, is not able to be done at the patient level specifically, but it is able to be done depending on the queries at the institution by the cardiologist or the provider. And then we can see the scope over uh, the several year period that we're going to uh, uh, query the information. So this is really sort of fulfills and um, uh, expands us into what we've been seeking, and that's what is the continuum of care for the cardiovascular patient, as we can see from the, uh, from the catheter-based intervention to surgery to the downstream re-interventions uh, as necessary, which we have not really understood, and there's really not that data available. So uh, we're unique in the fact we've got the <coughs> financial modeling for the, uh, with our clinical data, and now we have the ambulatory data as well, and so we're real excited about it. So hopefully we can spend about a month or two uh, looking at what it is we wish to, to obtain, uh, the types of spec specific data we're going to get, and then we can expand that and begin to uh, look at that data in the first quarter of uh, 2020. Um, the bylaws were updated reflecting uh, the cardiology uh, practices, and the uh, the board uh, voted to accept the resolution that the voting rights will be specific for recognizing each specialty would receive one vote in the general membership plus one vote for the administration. So if you're a hospital that provides surgery, cardiology, uh, you would have three votes. If you're a cardiology and institution, that would be two votes. But it's rare that we've ever had any type of a specific issue where those have made a, di uh, a specific difference. Um, the other, though, that was a little bit uh, uh, 
I'll say thornier, but is an evolution as the publishing fees. There are those journals that are now requiring the submission for publication and uh, uh, charging the authors between $1,500 and $2,000 per manuscript. And currently, uh, uh, that's also true uh, for the open uh, publications. Uh, but that's going to be beyond the scope of our current budget because you could imagine if we had 10 uh, manuscripts, particularly with the cardiology, uh, that's, that's real money. We were, that would be $15,000 uh, for, for that uh, types of submission. So uh, currently that's not going to be able to be funded uh, in our budget. But if we had external funding, we could earmark funds for that in the future. Uh, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spear. Um, next up, I will introduce our VCSQI Vice Chair, uh, Dr. Robert Shore, and our VCSQI Quality Improvement Advisor, Ms. Sherry White, who will provide an update to our VCSQI strategic plan. And as you all, um, some of you probably remember, this is an exercise we've we've held in our previous two meetings where we've worked on the VCSQI mission, vision, and core values, and now we're about to, uh, to see what's next here. So, Dr. Shore. Thank you very much. This is, as you know, an iterative process and really a collaboration for everyone. So I wanted to basically share where we are right now. And again, um, you can snap a photo or you can ask us to send you the, the link. But I wanted to share with you what we have as our upgraded mission, vision, and core values. And again, ask for your input, uh, perhaps not this evening, right away, uh, but to think about it, let it sink in a little bit more, and uh, give us your feedback. So for the mission, it was transform cardiovascular care to improve patient experience and value, capturing all of the essentials. Our big audacious vision is to optimize heart care outcomes through national collaboration, innovation, and research. Right now, we're a commonwealth with a little bit of an extension beyond, but we really envision this being a process that could be expanded beyond uh, and uh, to benefit uh, the patients all around. Core values, we got a lot of feedback, and one of the things that always comes back with with core values is, a, is to come up with a way to remember the core values. Each of these should be memorable. And so for core values, um, we elected to do VCS, VCSQI. So V is value-based best practices. C is collaboration and transparency. S is stewardship of healthcare and costs. Q is quality and patient-centered. And I is innovation data and analytic driven. So everyone can remember VCSQI. And again, if you have upgrades uh, to these, we want to hear from you all. Um, and uh, that's where we are right now. Thank you very much. So excuse me for going back and forth. Uh, so now we have defined what our mission, our values, and vision is. Let's go a little bit deeper and look into our strategic focus. Through the survey that we sent out in March, yeah, March, <laughs> what you told us is that you wanted to make a larger footprint across the nation. And what that could be is pretty much strength in the marketing and our collaboration strategies. Of course, we have a few new members with us today, so that's just one step that we can do. Um, increase the collaboration. We want to highlight, reduce burnout. You know, you all do a fabulous job. Our physicians, our surgeons do an amazing job. But we have to make sure we take care of them and therefore create strategies to help in that regard. Patient engagement. Make sure our patients are engaged in their health. You know, we shared a much, bunch of resources as it relates to sharing information or patient education um, that is available on our website. And also shared resources. A lot of you have provided protocols that you have in place that you, has been successful and share that and you're implementing it in your area where it's applicable, applicable and you see a difference. So with knowledge and togetherness and collaboration, there's power, which is what we see here in BCSQI. Harmonize cardiology and surgery. Oh, this is a great one. You know, Dr. Shore and Dr. Spear spoke earlier of why we have these combined meetings, but there's strength in togetherness, and together we can make change. So we're going to use that data, you know, integrate it, um, and 
develop standards of care. Identify the crossover and develop standards of care in that regard. You know, just so a few things to highlight, we have a coordination of care task force. If you're not on it and you want to help, sign up. Hello there. <laughs> um, education. You know, we have a lot of resources here. You know, a lot of knowledge we can share with one another. So let's pre create an opportunity that we can learn from each other. We have a lot of seasoned data managers here, and we have a lot of new data managers. So what are some elements, some um, uh, curriculums, outcomes, objectives that we can help establish just to make sure that everyone is functioning at the same level as a data manager, for example. But there's more mentorship opportunities available. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper. This is a snapshot, if you will, of the things you know, based off the footprint that you wanted or those abstracts that you wanted, we put some target action plans into place. And it's kind of color coded, if you can see, color coded, if you can see. So the green mean that it's um, completed. The yellow means that it's currently in process. Or in the red mean it's pending. So let me just move out of the way so for some of the people can see. So just to go into a little bit deeper, a larger footprint, footprint across the state and nation. We want to get 100% uh, participation from all of our programs here in Virginia. Um, again, we did some recruiting. We have a few more uh, members that are going to come to, or new recruits that's going to come to the upcoming meetings that we have. But we also want to do other coordinations or collaboration with other organizations such as uh, CO, COAP, um, Maryland, CSQI, MCSQI, and other organizations that are doing similar things that we are, but together as a nation, we can establish or create so much. Um, increase, increase collaboration. Promote alternative participation mechanisms. So hopefully at our next meeting, we're going to try this. We know that everyone may not be able to make certain meetings because of the proximity to your location. So let's try to see what we can do as far as web-based meeting and actually see your face and you can see us. Um, and you can still participate and engage what, without actually physically being here. We already created our enhanced website and it's still continuously progressing based off the feedback that you wanted to see or the information you wanted to, us to have available. We're still working on unblinding the data. We're working on uh, parallel tracks and VCS QI meetings for ACC and STS or cardiology and surgery. Um, we're working on the cost data for inpatient and outpatient care, which is what Dr. Spears spoke about earlier. Again, we're inviting others with us to see what we have to value or have to offer as a collective. Uh, we're gonna still continue to work to develop a website similar to the COAP collaboration. Um, again, create universal protocols. We have three protocols we created as a collective um, on our VCSQI website, uh, AFib, uh, readmission, and there's one more that I always forget. Blood conservation. Blood conservation. So those protocols are available to you, and this is what we collected or collaborated and prepared together. But we're going to create more. Uh, create a listserv. So we already have that on our website. It's self-subscribing. You know, you can unsubscribe, send out newsletters based on how you want to receive them. Um, and then our monthly newsletters. You know, whatever we have you know, heard something that's going to help you, we do send out those email blasts. So as it relates to fully integrating cardiology, we want to tailor the content to be inclusive and create custom content where both programs or both specialties can kind of overlap and engage in meaningful conversations. So you all provided a lot of input earlier in our quality meeting as it relates to how we can do that. And I'm going to send out a survey just FYI. Just to let you know, because I want some more information from you. Um, we're going to work and get the ACC benchmark data and identify that overlaps in services between the two programs. And we spoke about that a little bit earlier as well. Let's harmonize cardiology and surgery. So what does that mean for us? Let's get cardiology to the point of surgery and see state improvement. We're going to get there. You know, it can't be done overnight, but we are working on that. And that is something that actually the... Fox is missing, but it's in progress. Um, for education, we want to get a common understanding of the data across VCSQI members. We spoke a little bit about how we use Armis and the data, not Armis, Outlook. I'm sorry, Julia. Armis is the company. 
Uh, we spoke a little about how we use our data and use that data to promote change. But let's make sure everyone knows what the capability of, of the different programs so we all can create change together. Again, develop mentorship programs. You know, we have the opportunity to create a mentorship program against, with data managers. However, earlier we had a conversation with Dr. Deemer. And there may be an opportunity for us to create a mentorship program as it relates to the femoral and the radio, radio <laughs> um, injections or infusion. You know what I'm saying. Uh, so that's a mentorship opportunity as well. And that is something that you all can expect a survey from. Because I want to know or identify the barriers um, in your organization that have you doing one approach versus the other. And let's tackle it. Tackle it. Um, because the data shows that the femoral is has better outcomes. But why are most radio, thank you, you're fabulous, have better outcome, but why are certain programs still doing femoral? Is that right? Okay. <laughs> All right, training and abstraction. Again, this is goes to our data managers. We haven't started that yet, or we're still working on getting it together and rammed up. Um, certify and codify managers and duties. Develop a data manager's handbook and data collection protocols. So we created protocols as it relates to delivering care and outcomes. But let's create something together as it relates to collecting data and all that good stuff. Hello there. All right, as it relates to the things that we just presented on strategic plan, excuse me, is there any questions? Any feedback you want to give? We want to hear from you for at this moment. All right, is this scary for anyone or is this a good direction? Good, okay, I see smiling faces, great. Okay, so our next slide. Let's just um, go into a little bit about what we're doing with our cardiology members. So here's a breakdown of our cardiology members that we have. And the ones that are highlighted are actually the programs that we have that are actually doing the ACE uploads. And pretty soon I'm gonna put my dear friend Peggy on spotlight. Uh, because one of the things that we're working with, I've been reaching out, or I will reach out to a few of you. Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> to set up one-on-one -on -one phone calls with you as a way of onboarding you to the upload process. And, of course, introducing you to Peggy. So this is something that, you know, you understand the process, what we need from you as it relates to the raw data, um, as it relates to the demographics for the specific procedures. So we can tell you which films ACE wants and then the upload process. So at this time... Just to give Peggy a few moments and you to ask her any questions as well, I'm going to tag this over to my dear friend Peggy. She said, <laughs> what you, it, those, those organizations, those facilities are in fact uploading. So in fact, I got notified today that two of them had, I, I think one of them actually is completely done. So we're beginning the reads on two of them, which is great. Any questions for Peggy as it relates to this? Can you just review like, what you're doing with those? Sure. For appropriateness? Yeah, um, well, we're looking at it for appropriateness primarily, but what they're reviewing oh. are lesions. So um, they're looking at, I guess, the details related to the lesions that they see in the images. So, and they put, it's on an Excel spreadsheet, so it's pretty basic and straightforward, but it allows us to get information across all of the facilities in the same way. So 70% lesion is the same. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Let me see if I can add some clarity uh, to this particular uh, piece of it. Um, this uh, came out of um, what we've seen. We don't want to have any of the institutions uh, in the Commonwealth splashed on the front page of the uh, Washington Post or whatever uh, journal, newspaper, for inappropriate uh, PCI. And based on information and stuff that happened in Maryland, uh, we came up with a voluntary, non-legislated um, or mandated uh, approach um, based on the culprit trial of looking at less than 50 or greater than 50 percent stenosis and whether or not um, the lesions intervene met that threshold. Uh, the way we set this up was for a 95 percent confidence interval and in the null hypothesis and in an attempt to be able to roughly estimate that appropriate lesions were being intervened on. When they are not, um, they are, the films are sent and are blinded and reviewed by ACE, 
and then the lesion um, the information is sent back to the institution. So if it's uh, felt to be appropriate, if there's an appropriate mark. If it's felt to be a less than 50% stenosis that's been intervened on, that gets uh, marked on too. The information can be de-identified, is de-identified, and then can be re-identified by the institution to look at those cases to do a quality uh, review on those uh, particular cases. So it's our attempt to govern ourselves to review in a voluntary uh, fashion uh, PCI because if you put in a 70% or 90% stenosis on NCDR, uh, you don't know that's the case until you review the lesion. And uh, so it's our way of just keeping uh, everybody uh, focused on patient, appropriate patient care. I would note also, we ask for all of the patients for a quarter, and then we randomize it through a, a computer program. So we don't pick and choose specifically. It's really random. It goes through Armis and gets randomized, and then the, no, you're doing it differently? We do it differently. Okay. So, so the way we had envisioned was it went to Armis, it got randomized, and those films then went back where the, those... Patients then were requested from the institution to be sent to uh, ACE and it gets de-identified and reviewed. We have our own program that we use okay. for, and it's a, it's a SAS program, I'm sure it's very similar to what you would use to randomize to, so it's pretty standard. Do you have any other comments? No. Has anybody had any questions? So. Is there any way, uh, any time you guys want to link the results back to the actual case? Any what? I'm sorry. Back to the results. Back, back to the case, no? Yeah, so any anytime, anytime there's a question, you know, if you have 100% compliance, uh, we're done and we're reassured. But anytime there is not, the information then gets re-identified, uh, gets sent to the institution. The institution requests from, requests from ACE to uh, re-identify it, and then they go back to the individual case and review it. So it might have been that they had IVIS and, uh, or they had FFR and it was 0.4, even though it didn't look like it was a severe lesion and there was documentation that it was appropriate. So it goes back to the institution uh, for their review of, of those issues, cases in question. And it's a great opportunity for the, the institution to figure out what they need to do with regards to documentation to ensure that they're compliant. Because usually, if there is if there is any kind of variation, it can usually be explained. So it's figuring out where you need to explain it. So the ACC have an AVC algorithm. We used to have that in 4.0. I think we're going to get it in 5.0 relatively soon. So it would be very very interesting to compare the result of the algorithm, which is going to be in part of the, the right. record. So, so the eight. Right so, yeah. right, so the AUC are embedded in NCDR, and, and the issue really for this review <clears throat> is, is there correlation with the lesions that they're being, the appropriate lesions are being in, uh, intervened on? And we look separately at the appropriate use uh, for, the, for the lesions. Is it an ACS? Is it a you know, um, chronic, stable on three medications with un uncontrolled or recurrent symptoms. You know, whatever it is that we, we look at the AUC. For our more complex reviews, we do take the NCDRs and we benchmark against the NCDR and look at AUC in that light. Questions regarding ACE? I, I would say as one thing is uh, Anuj Gupta is one of the reviewers in Maryland and we have been talking, and I know I've mentioned this before, but uh, hopefully soon we will be in process to validate our review of cases in the way that theirs is a much more thorough but also much more expensive way of reviewing all of their PCI, their mandated unfunded uh, reviews. And so that's a, a, a way that we're going to try to look at and, and make sure that the process we've put in place, which makes sense, uh, is actually validated. And the 
you know, in the end, the key thing is, is the information that you discover, does it transform or change what you're doing in a positive way? Do you see quality doing this? So, in the end, that's, that's the most important thing. Patient-centric. Yep. Questions or comments in this regard? Anyone is interested in the process or, or doing this, um, just send an email out to me or Eddie and we'll get the ball rolling for you if you're not already uploading your film. And one quick thing, if you find, like if it come, the report comes back and you have questions, deeper questions about a particular review or a particular result, we can go back to the images and, we, and with the addition of the patient record, do a, bit, a, a deeper look at what, what was going on. Our goal, of course, is to have all of the PCI centers uh, to participate. And uh, we have had a recent conversation with ACE to make sure that we are fine-tuning the report and the information to make sure that it's in the form and in a timely manner that the institutions want to see it. Thank you very much. Hey, just a quick update on other things that we're working on. Um, of course, we talked a little bit about the inpatient financial matching with the CATH PCI data. Um, we're working on the TVT database. We're working on getting an agreement right now with ACC and STS. And, you know, we're also working with the data mapping with ARMIS, and we're going to hear an update about that as well a little bit later. Um, Dr. Spear spoke a little bit earlier about the information or uh, the outpatient data from Virginia Health information. Um, and then also we still have ongoing updates to our website. And of course, if there's something you want to see, you know, just tax and we'll try to make it happen for you. All right, so up next we have our fabulous part of the program, which, which is reviewing data. So I'm going to turn this over to our own Eddie Fauner. Thank you, Sherry. And one, one piece I'll mention just real quick before moving forward is we actually do have that agreement signed with ACC and STS for the TBT database. We just got the data specifications from them on Tuesday of this week, and Armis is, is already working on the data mapping so we can get the database model built. Um, really, this is the first time any external vendor has been allowed to, to build that, um, that data set before, so it'll take a little bit of time to map it out, but once we do, we can really be one of the first uh, to link that up. So we are making progress on the structural heart piece as well. Um, with regards to the transparency measures, really the goals here are to, to facilitate discussion amongst our programs. Um, the STS data has been unblinded for some time now, so we'll, we'll first look at cardiac surgery data. We'll take a look at the cardiology patients uh, in, in a little bit after a few of these graphs here. Um, but we've unblinded all of the cardiac surgery sites for a few key metrics. We'll look at the top performers, see um, if there's any trends over time. We have a couple comparison periods in terms of looking at the data from the last two years and then the most recent six-month period. And the goal is to facilitate discussion and, and understand how we can use that to drive our collective quality uh, forward. So don't be surprised if I call on you during the session. Um, our population here is isolated cabbage cases for the last two and a half years. Um, standard STS report specs, I'm happy to send any of those out, but they're in your long STS manual too. And we have STS and VCSQI benchmarks. I also apologize for the, for the resolution here. Don't be afraid to, to move a little bit forward. And um, we also will sign, we'll send out a, a reblinded version of this afterwards. Um, but you'll see on the left side is the group of high volume centers, which is de defined based on a volume threshold, I think, of, of more than about 250 cabbages a year. In the middle is our medium volume, and the right is the few low volume centers. Uh, this graph shows new onset of AFib, and the yellow bar here shows the two year benchmark, so calendar year 2017, 2018 combined, versus the blue bar, which is the latest uh, six months worth of data. And the two little reference lines, which are almost overlapping there, are the VCSQI and STS averages, which are right around 25% or so. Let me step out of your way so you can see. So there were a number of improvements. If you look at any difference in the bars here, for instance, on Lynchburg, 
in the medium volume or on a few of the sites in the low volume, whenever you see the yellow bar is larger than the blue bar, that's where you had an improvement in the at least the most recent time period. So is anyone brave enough to go out on a limb and say how they improved over the, over the recent era here? I thought we had it coming. I just wanted to ask, when we're looking across this, you know, once again, it could be an issue where people are not coding all the same way. Um, sometimes it's a matter of data element interpretation based upon the manual. And maybe they think, or some people may think, if you're paroxysmal before, you're not supposed to count it in the end. What are we doing? Is everyone coding AFib the same way? Judy's gone into great detail with this um, over our phone calls, and I think it's good food for discussion still. So I just wonder, are we all coding it the same way? Sherry, this is new onset. I think she was talking Listen. about what kind of aphid they had pre out as opposed to <clears throat> new onset. I think everybody, we've gone over this so many times. You know, if they are in normal, or not in AFib going into the OR, and they have AFib at all afterwards, it's, you know, a complication. If they had any AFib at all beforehand, it's not new onset. This is all the new onset. So I would hope everyone's coding it the same way. Beth still brings up a good point in that this has to be apples to apples comparisons for it to make sense. Um, if we're not coding things the same way, then it doesn't matter if, you know, if one person's at 10% and one's at 20 because they're, they're two completely, you know, in two completely different contexts. So good, good point, Beth. Um, that's something that I would say is a strength of VCSQI in terms of our monthly calls among database managers, both for STS and ACC. Um, at the same time, it's, there's always, you know, the databases are so complex that there's always room for confusion. So we'll, we'll strive to stay on the same page there. Other comments or questions on this? New AFib. Okay, our next next chart, thanks, Sherry, is 30-day readmission by site. And we've actually seen a little bit of a drop in terms of the VCSQI rate in recent era. It's about 9.3%, which is a hair underneath STS. Um, and in past periods, it's been closer to 10. Um, here we've seen a number of changes. Again, whenever you see bars that are kind of overlapping, it'll mean there's been a change in the, in the recent six months of data here. Um, on the high volume side, Inova made a, a pretty significant improvement in terms of more than halving their rate. Uh, Mary Washington as well. And Henrico has, has done really good too. Questions, comments, suggestions to Judy? The only thing I would say about this is that now with Care Everywhere, which fortunately we're able to use, like I definitely feel like I'm finding more people that are going to another center that has Epic that I never would have found before because if we didn't get a phone call, we didn't know they went there. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like, you know, when you look at the Medicare data, like if we had what the Medicare readmission looked like and what we have in SDS, we can only be accountable for who, well, who comes back to our hospital. Now, if we know, you're morally obligated if you know somebody went somewhere, but I definitely think for me, I am finding way more people than I used to because they went to the smaller little hospital that was close to home. They didn't drive all the way back to Charlottesville. I'm not excusing that. I'm not saying, you know, our rates haven't gone up. I'm not saying that, but I definitely feel like abstracting them finding more. I feel like. And I know some people can't use care everywhere, unfortunately, but if that's the case, numbers should be going up, not down. Yeah. So yeah. Why, do you, why do you think we'd be seeing the other trend? Eddie? Oh, Linda, go ahead. In addition to what Dr. Spear already talked about in our quality meeting, I think it's just a, a it's the patient population we're dealing with right now. I've seen more younger people. They've been 
They've also been staying a little bit longer because we've kind of got this mental thing about readmission, so they haven't been going out as quick. But I think it may just be the luck of the draw, the patients that we're seeing right now. Because we haven't done anything different from the prior year. I, I, thought, uh, I thought Alan had talked about doing different things for uh, patients with pleural effusions and well, some wound care and that. some other. We have done that, but. And pleural effusions, pericardial effusions. But we, I've also seen the pericardial effusions go down. So I, I guess the question would be for any of the ones that we've seen a significant drop, are there new protocols in place, or is it just a variation? Is it a way you're managing people more as outpatients than actually admitting them, but they're coming back in? Uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways to, to look at this. Are there other thoughts on readmissions? It may be worth a deeper dive for those that have really dropped to reach out and say what are the best practices, what, are, what is being done differently. We could, we could dive into the readmission reasons as well. That's something we've done before. Our last STS measure here is risk-adjusted renal failure. This is looking at a, a recalibrated ratio, although the, the coefficient is not significant in this case, but um, for observed AKI, uh, looking at observed divided by expected, so anything above one is, you're seeing more, more observed cases than the STS model expects, under one is, is the opposite. Um, in this sense, we've seen uh, a number of improvements, although the VCSQI state average is still uh, above one. I'm not sure if there's anyone from Carilion here, but they've made a, a notable improvement among their high volume site, among the high volume sites. Dr. Sane? I'm, I'm from cardiology, from Carilion, so this may be wrong, but I, I said it. It's probably dangerous for me to speak about the uh, surgical aspects, because uh, I'm in cardiology, but uh, I think I heard that, they, that our surgeons have been using ultrafiltration fairly liberally. Uh, for patients who are volume overloaded, and that had been counted as a, a renal failure outcome, and and they have down titrated that practice. I don't know if that's if that's true or not, but that's I think that's what I heard. Have others experienced the same? You know, I I think for us, we had a period. Um, I guess it was 2016, 2016 into early 2017 where. Our uh, OE ratio was a little over one, uh, and then over the last two years, we had a handful of patients, and our, our volume uh, overall, cab cabbage volume, has gone down in the last, uh, I'd say, the last calendar year. Um, and we've had some patients that have had, you know, baseline creatin of three, 3.2, and uh, I, I'd like to ask the question to other programs, are your nephrologists willing to, and patients with you know, stage four renal disease, are they willing to dialyze pre-surgery or not? Because ours have been totally against dialyzing, and that's killed us. Because when our denominator is small, and you add two or three of those patients a year, that puts our OE ratio into the tank. And it's been very frustrating for us. We recently uh, have a new nephrologist who's been willing to do that, did a patient for us about six weeks ago. But in general, that's a killer for us. Any thoughts, anybody? They really think they're going to go. They they dialyze them beforehand, at least once, so I can code it. I, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know exactly. Um, 
We, anybody over three, we dialyze pre-op, whether it's regardless. And they, they don't have a choice. We, they, they dialyze them. So the other thing is we uh, wait routinely after the uh, catheterization. We'll wait uh, four to five days. Yeah. And we're, uh, it but we have waited seven to ten days we have uh, we've tried to maximize patients prior to going to surgery but again we have a an older nephrology group is very conservative they did just hire a new person on at a fellowship who was allies for us but it's painful I mean we've had people that have been three eight three nine who we go to the OR and they re refuse to dialyze them and you know that's you know you get cardiology on one side who's pushing you to do them because there's no recourse because obviously that patient's a real high risk PCI and so cardiac surgery would be a whole lot easier. And these aren't your most, you know, healthiest of patients. These are people who are usually your most non-compliant and they live in a hotel room and uh, and so you know you know damn well that, you know, it's gonna be a renal failure. Among other complications. Our argument is the tripling of mortality if when they go yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. Post -op. Appreciate your feedback. Any other comments, questions on our STS measures? Any other measures that people would want to see in the past? We've looked at extubation. Um, we've looked at blood. I didn't see as as uh, distinctive differences in those charts, so I, I kind of picked and chose the, the ones that looked like they would be most interesting, but if we want to go back, we, we certainly can, or, or any other uh, metrics to open up for unblinding. We can discuss on our, on our quality committee as well, but. Um, in terms of the CAF PCI measures, this is, Probably our second round of really delving into the to the ACC metrics here. Um, the next set of charts will look at cases from Q2 2018 to Q1 2019. Um, an interesting trend here when we look at procedure volumes is that I don't think our diagnostic volumes are going down, but I think the number of centers who are entering and or submitting their cases uh, seems like some are, on, are only submitting PCIs and they've stopped entering diagnostics. Has that happened to anyone uh, thus far? UVA, ANOVA, Bon Secours, so that's, that's probably a reason for that drop. Uh, PCI has remained relatively steady. There's a little bit of a dip, but I think there's also a lag uh, sometimes in terms of the, the cases being entered. We're looking at about 16 hospitals here, by the way, who have submitted their NCDR data to us thus far. So as Sherry mentioned earlier, I did a dive into the data by vascular access site. So this first chart, we, we grouped them similarly in terms of low, medium, and high PCI volumes. Th these are all PCI cases, by the way. Or, or this first one is actually is all cath visits, my apologies. Then we're looking at all uh, PCIs afterwards. Um, this shows the breakdown of femoral versus radial by site and volume group. And in kind of the, the text down below that's a little hard, tough to see, the VCSQI rate, it's almost 50-50, 47 femoral, 52 radial. It's been trending up, so femorals are, are increasing over time here. But there's still a ton of variation by site. Some sites are 10% radial, 90% femoral, others are the exact opposite. So it seems like potentially interesting opportunity for some standardization here. Next, we'll delve into some of the outcomes metrics. So here we're looking at RBC, your whole blood transfusion by site. Data vary from some with, with no cases reported up to about four or five percent here, actually three or four percent. Interestingly, the VCSQI benchmark is almost twice that of NCDR two versus one. 
reporting a lot more cases or we're doing something differently here? Now, we had talked about, I think, before, did this include patients going to the OR? Yes, this includes, right, so, this includes all PCIs. Right, so that, um, that may or may not play a role in this, but it certainly looks like there's an opportunity. Let me look at the next slide. Here we're, we're still looking at the same metric, but we've broken it down into radial versus femoral access. And the data look similar at first glance, but look at the axis on the left-hand side. So for the radial cases, it goes 1 to 5. Femoral, though, we go 0 to 15. So it's, it's almost three times the difference here. And we see the, about the same in terms of the state uh, average here, our, our 16 hospital average. We're looking at about 1% for radial versus about 3 for femoral axis. But even interestingly, within each group, there's still a lot of variation among sites. And please stop me if you have any comments, questions, observations on these charts. Um, this next chart shows a bleeding event within 70, 72 hours. It's kind of the aggregate bleeding metric. But this one, we, we just showed it for all PCI cases. I wasn't able to, to slice this by access site. but the data is, is very similar to the RBC transfusion data, so I think we can interpolate this as being similar if we, if we sliced it by access site. So unlike the other where there was a higher transfusion, this is actually a lower bleeding in the VCSQI line. Correct. So the VCSQI transfusion rate is higher, but we have a lower bleeding rate. last set of slides here deals with the comp composite complication measure, so death, emergency, cabbage, stroke, or repeat target vessel revascularization. The first one just shows the, again, the differences among sites for all PCIs. Still a lot, some, again, with, with no, none of these major morbidities that were reported, up to about four plus percent at some centers. And then when we slice by access site, you'll still see big variance between the femoral, radial. Radial is about 1.3% here, femoral is about 4%. So you're still looking at about a 3x difference. And you go back to slide, what's the NCDR? Oh, On this one, I, I couldn't find the benchmark. so. Go back for that one. I don't get access to the benchmarks myself, so I'd have to rely on one of our data managers to provide that info. Just as an observation, a lot of the low volume centers are going to be um, not doing the high risk, more complicated patients. So you would expect um, those numbers to be lower in general than those being done at a center that is doing it with Impella and you know, a whole bunch of other more complicated things because all those other patients get shipped. Where there's variation within the group may be worth looking at um, a low complication versus a higher complication. Um, if it's a low volume and it's just the, the N is small and one or two people may make that number go up, but um, there's some opportunity along the line there too. So my question to you all is, Based on some of our historical work in VCSQI where we've identified gaps in performance for transfusion, for a fib, for readmissions, is there a way to protocolize this, uh, this methodology in terms of vascular access site? Um, would, would one of our cardiologists care to comment on, on that question? Contos? So in terms of access site, do you, do you think there's any opportunity for, for VCSQI or a group like ours to protocolize? Uh, you're asking the wrong person. I'm a non-interventionalist, but yeah, I would think you probably could. I think you're seeing an uptake in institutions as time goes on. It's uh, Part of it is the decreased complication rate, but also 
What we found too is patient comfort. You may have specific patients who recognize they can get it done through the wrist and you just don't want to have a femoral um, cath anymore. But um, I would see that's what you're seeing in some centers. For example, ours, we're about 90% radial. And, and we're mostly uh, radial also. I think part of it is um, uh, education of, and comfort of the operator. Um, if all they ever did was femoral and that's all they're ever going to do, it's going to be hard to switch them unless there's an institutional push from a complication rate. So one of the things we're looking at is trying to look at um, as we have, as has been done before on the surgical side as far as complications and then applying a cost to what that complication means, either direct or indirect, vis-a-vis um, -vis transfusion, AFib, et cetera. We're trying to do the same thing with uh, the calf procedures, and then we can take that back to the institutions and try to do best practices. Um, what There was a paper, I believe, that looked at interventions and as far as the femorals, um, they're doing more and more radials, but the ones that have to do femoral are really sick people or people that have a lot of disease in the arm and have a lot of disease all over. So um, not surprisingly, uh, there are complications there, but they're also increasing, uh, apparently increasing complications from the radial side, although not as bad, just by, by sheer volume. So in terms of next steps, in terms of eliciting feedback from some of our, our best practices, some of our top performing sites, can one of our, our surgical representatives comment on, on how we've done that process, how we've gone about that process in the past, and how do we, how do we pull people together, get, get that information from these potential um, model performers? Dr. Spear, I know, I know you want to comment here. I think it's a matter of giving the institution the results and then having a, uh, you know, either one of the cardiology leadership from within the organization participate in looking at the results. There, there are three or four of those high, so-called high volume that it's um, you know, over 50% femorals. And I, I think I agree with what Bob's saying, but on the other hand, a physician reluctance to change in the face of data like this is, is um, a little tricky. But providing the administrators and the institution that, in, that information is pretty powerful. So imagine if we had all the hospitals participating and uploading into ACE and, and what those data were, and then had further information with this with their risk and complications and target it to site. Yeah, I didn't in, wish to imply in any way that I didn't think people should change because I think, um, you know, uh, uh, doing the radial approach is really, uh, for the most part, the way to go. Did you? No, some, saying, some way of linking that would be cool. Um, Winchester, we're about 80% radial, and our guys are like, radial, why not? And what we were finding when you first trying to get people to convert is patients were coming in and saying, hey, do you guys do it from the arm? And so it was a patient-driven uh, experience for our physicians. Patient satisfaction is clearly significantly higher. Is there a way to silence the that? Yeah, we'd, we'd be able to look at like the status quo. We, we did it in the last meeting, although we didn't break it down specifically by access site, but the sites that were um, that were giving more radial, I think, had, had lower length of stay. The other issue is we're moving more and more towards outpatient and same-day procedures. That's not going to happen if you're fair. We can track that, too. We do, we, ACE actually has a lot of data on um, femoral or radial. Well, I think we'll what, I, what I would uh, just ask is we're moving forward in this. This is uh, a work in progress. And if the, an institution has a specific question that you want to track, a question that you want to ask, uh, have answered, let us know. And we're, again, this is all about everyone around the, the tables here, 
how we, we can move the ball forward to improve uh, care and reduce costs. I think from the radial standpoint, we're reducing vascular complications, improving um, patient satisfaction, reducing cost. And so part of the next step is acquiring the data and then providing it to the institutions and where they fit in the Commonwealth and Sounds good. Well, we will send out all of these slides. My, my ask of everyone in the audience is please share these amongst your facilities. Um, and let's start a, a, a dialogue here in terms of putting this information into action. So you're not sending unblinded, We're not sending it unblinded, no. I'll, I'll send everyone their individual codes as well. We, we don't want to, we don't want to cherry pick too much right now. Um, and one brief housekeeping, housekeeping item before we move on to our next site, uh, next presentation is that we are offering CME credits and, and CEU credits for this evening there were handouts. Um, if you haven't signed in, look for my look for my wife, Freedom. She has she's got the sign-in sheet somewhere around here. Um, we'll send out an email blast to everyone afterwards with the CME info. You can text it in um, up until a week afterwards. The text system is active. Otherwise, you can email me and, and we can do it manually. Um, so just just an FYI. Uh, there's Freedom. Was there anybody that did not sign in? I will come to you. Okay. I got Liza. All right, we got you. Um, next up, I will introduce Jula Saraski, president of Armis Corporation. Jula has been our data analytics partner, data warehouse for VCSQI for as long as I can remember, um, 15 plus years now. Jula is going to show us some of the new technologies, new reports that we've been working on in collaboration um, in terms of some, first they were three state, 90th percentiles, now there are four states. We've added in Maryland. And um, next we'll jump into some of their new technologies with Google, machine learning, um, the Internet of Things, and I'm, I'm sure lots of other, lots of other uh, powerful analytics here. We'll just have to get our projector working. Yeah. Yes. So... We're showing that right now, yeah. Right, good evening, and uh, thank you so much again to give me the opportunity, opportunity to present something very interesting for you at the end of the presentation. Before that one, I would like to share the slides which actually analyze the poor state uh, outcomes of certain uh, measurements. That's the 90th percentile ranking. And, uh, uh, on OE ratios, so uh, that's uh, one second. It's Virginia, Michigan. So this is better, Mike. Yeah, much better. It's uh, Virginia, Michigan, Washington, and Maryland together. So this one is a quick view of. I'm standing here because the resolution of the screen is not that good, and you guys don't know what to see or not. Not. Okay, I don't know where to go. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you can see here the case uh, proportions of MSTCVS, VCS guy in the second loop right here, all of them, and then you can see, see the, the <clears throat> cab only are dominating most of the states, and, uh, but the other categories are really uh, high as well o overall. So I just put these things together to for the future analytics, which we are planning to do, especially with machine learning, where we don't need to worry about the, the presence of the STS or any other prediction values, but we would like to provide you some kind of a tool set and uh, algorithms which actually predict some more complicated cases, outcomes. So next one, please. This is the evaluation of the case, uh, case mix here in the state of Virginia. You can see that from 86% cabbage only down to 28, anything between, and uh, <clears throat> the, obviously the reverse order uh, of the other categories. So uh, you can see this hospital has 50, more than 50% of the cases never analyzed in any kind of outcomes measures or, or reporting. So 
that's that's the reason I put this in to focus on this this area where um, more than one quarters of the cases have never been part of any analytics. <clears throat> okay, next one. So that 98 percentile a quick review. It's not an average. It's not a, a summarization. Of everything. This is just give you the ranking of of if you are better than 90th percentile than than 90 percent of the other hospitals. So if your OE ratio is, is better than 90 percent of the other uh, cases, other hospitals, you are among the top 10 percent. So that's the whole point. Let's move on. <clears throat> so you, unfortunately these numbers are unreadable, so I have to go through very quickly. So the first one is uh, Maryland, VCSQI, uh, Michigan, and uh, and uh, Washington, the COPE initiatives. What you're seeing here, which you're going to see, is the number of cases, the number of sites, the OE ratio. The OE ratio is not, uh, greater than one, which is above the gray bar, and uh, 90th percentile. The 90th percentile in each state represents the value where certain hospital has to be better than that OE in order to be a number 10, among the top 10. So even in some hospitals doing well within the state, it's not necessarily going to be well in the overall analysis, which is the next slide. <clears throat> so VCSQI is the green, and this particular area down below, it's representing the state's in order. So who is the best, second, third, and fourth? This is the OE of uh, operated mortality. The differences are extremely small. Um, I'm on the top three. I mean, hundreds of percent, uh, hundreds of points. And uh, uh, the Maryland group is not that much better either, 1.5, 1.15. So here and underneath, you can see that how many of the hospitals out of the state uh, belong to the, the top 10%. So in this case, uh, there is only one in VCSKI, but the overall OE ratio, based on the overall ratio, this is the best uh, state at this point. Next one is the morbidity or mortality. Same information, we can skip this and go to the overall. Now you can see two of the hospitals here uh, are among the top 10% um, uh, uh, of the, the, the hospitals. And uh, again, uh, Virginia is doing better than any other state in this area of, of measurements. <clears throat> Next one is the prolonged ventilation. And um, again, we can skip this, go to the next one. Here, VCS guy is still dominating, to still the number one. Uh, Michigan was not that happy about this because they're trying to do that for 15 years, and then, but there are some uh, performers who are not really that good, as you can see. And that, uh, Dr. Prager pointed out that the, top, the bottom five is belong to the state. So when they showed this, uh, I didn't present that, they did. And <clears throat> so it was some kind of a dissatisfaction of this, but, um, Overall, I think uh, you can see that the majority of the, the hospitals are below one here. So being good here and being the best means a lot. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> okay, next one is permanent stroke. Here again, here uh, uh, VCS guy is still leading the pack with uh, very good performances and uh, recognizable that that uh, OE ratio is relatively uh, better than everybody else's. Uh, next one is the REOP, and the REOP here is uh, 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 COPE is doing better than anybody else, and et cetera. ECS guy is the third in this category. Renal failure is, again, ECS guy the third. The difference are not that big in this area, uh, we still have uh, one, actually, nobody is in, uh, on the tap, top 10. There are several hospitals belong to the other organizations without any kind of renal failure issues. You can challenge that uh, with uh, analyzing the data and seeing the data quality. 
<clears throat> stroke, another deep sternal infarction is, uh, again, a lot of hospitals don't. The values are extremely low, and um, the OE here in VCSK is 1.11 but the best is 0 0.98 or something like that. So it's very little differences among the hospitals. So that's the overall ranking, very simple. Just add the, uh, the ranking numbers on each categories and the lower number wins the race. So that's, it's, uh, as you can see, the differences are extremely slow, uh, low here on the operative mortality morbidity or mortality. <clears throat> this is better here. Prolonged ventilation is clearly identifiable in VCSQI, doing better than anybody else. Same here in permanent stroke. And uh, <clears throat> re-up is number three, is, um, you know, sort of probably uh, interesting to talk about this by, the, by your uh, hospitals. So, so the VCSQI have 13 points and everybody else has uh, 18, 19, and 20. So that's the analysis which I did. There's nothing scientific about this, just uh, a suggestion for Eddie to do the 90 percentile. With new technologies and new analytics, we can do better. Oh, that's too fast. Can we go back? Any questions on the 90 percentile? Yeah. Way back. What, what percentage of progress are represented it's possible that you have a selection bias for the best performing sites in a certain state relative to others. You know the percentage of sites of all the, of all the sites, yeah. so all the cabbage programs, yeah. for example, in Michigan, what percentage are Everybody. Everybody. In, in On all four, these four initiatives, we have every state. They're also? So yeah. Okay. yeah. We're missing a couple, actually. Who? Okay, so, so the, uh, I forget the date range, I think it was two years. Uh, you can see it on the previous slide somewhere. If you can go back, backward. 2017, 2018. Yeah, you're going to the wrong direction. Yeah. Okay, so 2017, 2018, it's 20, 25,000 some hundred uh, uh, patients involved with cabbage. So it's two years analysis, but everybody who has data in here and uh, on those four states has been analyzed. So, and then we, we have everybody's data, the, the hospital's data. So we're still missing two from here though? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that. Okay, so let's move on to a different uh, area. So this is a project which we are doing. I presented something last time, we enhanced this or oh, it's animation? Uh, maybe, okay, that's my fault. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> the control chart. So this is, um, when I would like, the reason I'm showing this to you because there is a, some kind of correlation between the control chart and presentation and the next one for machine learning. Here, the learning period is the white area here, which you see, can be changed. And, um, and the learning period, the previous period, set the standards, the toler toleration for investigating the ongoing performances. So in this case, I think the three years is the learning period and started before, uh, that's horrible, in 2015, I guess. And, uh, and it shows the variation for each month. That's the VCSQI group for morbidity and mortality rate changes. And uh, the gray area is the place where the, the standard deviation is two standard deviation above and below. That's the to tolerance area. So if you can continuously doing better, meaning that you are outside of the gray area constantly, then it considered to be improvement. The opposite, if you do that above, that continues with an, an uh, indication of doing something wrong. On, a, on the lo uh, lower side, there's an, a site in Virginia, also uh, uh, very, uh, can see the different monthly outcomes. 
you cannot go lower than zero percent, is right? So the mor morbidity mortality cannot be zero. So in this case, you can see several times the hospitals uh, <clears throat> has no morbidity nor mortality in a certain period of time. So the big enhancement here, besides being able to see individual hospitals uh, versus the, the VCS guy or two different hospitals against each other, is that when I click on the performance here and somewhere here, the next slide, it shows you the price differences, the cost differences. So it can show you that, <clears throat> for example, what it says here, I, I cannot read this even from me. Can you read that from somewhere? So, so the numbers here interesting is the percentage of the, the that percentage is 1.7 or 17, well, I don't know. Which one are you pointing to? This one. Okay, yeah, that is 12%. 12%. So 12% of the cases on the state of Virginia take 24 plus percentage of the overall cost when you have uh, morbidity or mortality cases. That was in uh, March 1st, 2015. Uh, 15. It was just a random number. Here, you can see that, uh, what is this number here? Uh, 201. No, no that, that one? this one, this one. That one is 8.63. And uh, below is 17%. So it's a relatively the same ratio, even though that, okay. <laughs> And the, the other interesting things to do, to see if the, the percentage of increase for that particular morbidity or mortality rate uh, uh, cases compared to the cases where there's no problem at all. So that's the number here. So you can see that the average in the state of Virginia, the difference is if you have morbidity or mortality cases, the average cost is 242% higher. The median is 222, so not much of a difference. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know what is this. Number. 28. Pardon me? 28. 228 and 117 or something like that. 177. So, yeah, so, so you can also see the time difference. So if you go back time and see the cost associated with this uh, in this month overall, you can compare it to the current cost. But the interesting thing is not much difference of the impact. So when you see that, obviously, several years later, the cost was much lower than today. But the impact of that particular patient group uh, with the morbidity and mortality cases uh, affected the overall cost ratio almost identically. So I think if we can look at this a little bit more carefully, the improvement could be the impact of certain kind of patient population with certain kind of outcomes over the entire cost of certain hospital and state would be more meaningful than see what is the cost saving because the cost going up constantly, we know that for all the time. So it's, it's not really fair to compare the cost of operation 10 years ago compared to today, not even five years ago, as we all know. So just, <clears throat> just that was one of the the reason we developed this, to give you or the management and uh, Eddie uh, we we're going to develop this on a place where you can actually access this. It's still in the lab, but we see this as a tremendous opportunity to provide you additional insight of, of the data, combining clinical and, and financial outcomes analysis. Any question here or suggestion? <clears throat> All right. So let's move on to data science near in the near future. So we are very, very unfortunate, not unfortunate, fortunate <laughs> to put the, to have a very close and great relationship with uh, Google. And um, now they know about this uh, relationship between BCS and Armas and providing us tremendous amount of support and uh, help to reach the next level of data analytics and, and developing tools which you have never seen before. So I would like to just explain to you what is and show you some examples where we are. It is really early stage, I have to tell you that. It requires a lot of learning, a lot of adjustment, and more likely more data, which ex uh, 
correlates with Mike's presentation and everybody else. So quickly, we all learned that hearing these terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning. So this slide just tells you where uh, machine learning is belong to. So the next uh, click will uh, highlights the area where we are focusing, and that's machine learning. Next one. Even in machine learning, there are certain area unsupervised learning, and use those techniques for different kind of outcomes and, and, and analytics. We're going to focus on su uh, supervised learning and learn about the significance of that. And reinforcement learning is another category in machine learning. It's constantly changing because of the science and, the, and mathematics and results. <clears throat> Next, please. So the machine, machine learning is a science, science, basically a scientific study of different algorithms, uh, algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to perform specific tasks without any <coughs> explicit instructions. It's very important to understand this because we have nothing to do about the methodology and the, the analytics, what the computer does. We have much more things to do, how to feed the, da the data to the computer and what kind of data. So it's analysis, imagine that the, the Mars Explorer is driving itself on Mars. And it's analyzed the road, analyzed the situation. It's not programmed. So the Mar that, that machine doesn't know what's coming. It just reacts what it sees. And that's machine learning. We're developing algorithms without knowing how the software will do it. And overall, we can move on. The algorithms build a mathematical model. So, so all of these algorithms which are running, and we, the result you're going to see this, is a result of 1,000 samples each time to find out the best possible outcomes. And outcomes meaning prediction value. So right now, we're just using uh, an algorithm which looking at 1,000 uh, uh, samples, uh, methodologies which built into the machine learning uh, environment. That's why the partnership with Google is extremely important because they're maintaining this environment, adding more and more statistic, statistic, statistical capabilities, more algorithms based on us, based on somebody else, some other people who are using the same environment. And, and machine learning is closely related to compu computational statistics, which focus on making pre uh, predictions using computers. So again, it's not like what a statistician uh, do with regression algorithms. This is the computer decide what is the best algorithm to predict the next value based on new information. Let's go next one. Okay, we can skip this and move on. And data mining, you can hear it as well, as, as much as as uh, machine learning, and it's, a, uh, it's part of the machine learning area, but it's unsupervised learning. Based on a, uh, we're not doing data mining. We're trying to de develop prediction models, which is very different. Next one, please. So machine learning is also referred to as a predictive analytics, and you will see the result after this. Let's move on. So what is the supervised learning very quickly? Supervised learning is algorithm built on mathematical model uh, of a set of data that contains both the input and the desired output. So we taught the computer to analyze STS cases and predict the readmission possibilities. So what it does is takes all of the values and, and it said focus on readmission. And it said, okay, this person readmitted the hospital and the computer learned the characteristic of this patient and move on and move on and on and on and on. So next one, let's go correctly. Um, this training data and, and uh, algorithms changes and all kind of uh, techniques which requires human interactions, data scientists, mathematicians, and Eddie, we're probably gonna be able to do some work together on this because your background. And, and come up with better and better prediction models. And uh, you will see why it's very important. Okay. Okay, so how, is, uh, how does it work? This is a very simple example. I find it on the, on the web and I like that. 
So it's basically how to teach the computer to recognize a cat and um, from images. And you do that over and over again and classify this as an image of the cat, image of the other cat, and then ask the computer to classify this. So the next time this new image comes in, the computer has two options at this case. Is that a cat or a dog? And that's the ratio which we're looking at. How many times the algorithm and the prediction model can categorize the, the image as a cat or a, a, a dog or not, not cat. And if you think about this, how many times you see AI developed to analyze X-ray images and, and images in, at all recognized tumors or kind of, of uh, <clears throat> uh, diagnostic area used by, by computer. As a matter of fact, Google capable of recognizing the male or female just looking at the retina of a person without knowing anything else. And nobody knows how it works. But if you're looking at the glass, uh, the camera in the Google environment, the Google can tell you if you are a male or female. And nobody knows why is that and how it does. So that's the kind of machine learning we're looking at. Anyway, so these are the supervised learning workflow. You train the machine and you do the prediction. And the prediction model constantly learning new and new tricks and new uh, rules and new outcomes if you enter new patients to it, okay? So this is the readmission prediction case. We did all the hospitals as we were able to combine the data, VCSQI alone, and the same hospitals without the VCSQI. And um, we recognize that 9,332 cases of uh, readmission, which is 99.7%, VCSKI is 9.47%, 9.5%, and the uh, group without the VCSKI went up by four hundreds of the points. Next one. So this is interesting. What you see here is when the patient was readmitted to the hospital. And the majority is be uh, before, I don't know, so this whole case, this is, uh, I think that's the 30th, isn't right? 30 days here. So that's what represents the number of patients who readmit the, the hospital one day, two days, three days, etc. So the peak is one, two, three, four days when most of the people, people readmitted to the hospital. So that would be an interesting next study if the prediction model said the patient is going to be readmitted to figure out when. So you can see that you can go on and on and on with these tools all the time. Okay, next one. Oh, can we go back? So the top five readmission reason among these uh, sites. Uh, okay. Now this is VCSQI, that's okay, we can stay here. So the VCSQI model here is one, two, three, four, the fifth day is the highest number of patients re uh, going back to the hospital on the fifth days. And the top reasons are uh, related readmission, other, other congestive heart failure, arrhythmia, heart block, or I don't even know how to pronounce that. Anyway, so, so these are the five top reasons the hospitals, that the patients are readmitted to the hospitals. This one also can be used for teaching the algorithm better prediction. We are, uh, this is three, four days of, of learning. The reason we couldn't do that earlier because of HIPAA, and we had to have a proper uh, protection and then the systems and uh, all kind of software in the Google environment in order to run this, even without patient spe uh, a specific patient uh, identification. So next one. So we have to go slowly here. So what you're seeing here, and the name, I didn't want to put it here because the name of this, this matrix is a confusion matrix. Now don't ask me who came up with this, but that's a confusion matrix indicating that the, that's the early result. So what you're seeing here is the above the prediction by the, the computer and on the, those are the columns and the rows are the actual readmission value. So we achieved 66% success when the prediction is no and the patients did not readmit it to the hospital. So what you're doing here is you train the machine with the patient population and use another patient population to test the machine. Not the same thing because that's cheating. 
<clears throat> so, so when we predict yes, 33.5% times the patients did not admit it to the hospital. So it's similar to the, so what is this, 66% uh, success rate and 33% false positive. Are you guys with me? So, but the difference here compared to the STS algorithms and STS prediction, the STS predict not readmission, but do you have a readmission algorithm in STS? No. But reoperation is a percentage. Here we're just saying yes or no. And the result is not that good at this point. The, the other thing is that when the readmission yes, we predicted no, so it's 41%. And the success rate on these times when we are predicting the patients go, will be predicted, uh, readmitted to the hospital is on, below 60%. But this is only one single run. We did not modify anything, we didn't change anything until the next few slides you're gonna see this. So if you click here, the system also tells us what are the 20 most important variables which that use to create these results. And those are the 20 variables from the STS. The difference between those and the rest is extremely small. There's no statistical difference between the top two and the rest. I don't want to make any conclusion yet, but that's what it is. Next one. The next one is the VCSQI database alone. So nobody else but VCSQI. So the success rate for predicting no went down by 8%, and the yes and yes went um, up by 8%. So it's interesting. So the false positive is lower than the previous site, but the false negative is, is higher. And the, 20 most important variables shrink to, one next thing, it's only 19. So there's no, uh, the machine did not find anything more important if you're using the, the VCSK database. So this, what is the significance here? It's data matters. How much data you have, it's influencing the, the algorithm and the results greatly. We haven't even checked the quality of the data. We haven't organized the data differently, didn't remove something and, and outliers and things like that. It's really just want to show you what come, what's coming. Next one. The next one is the VCS, the group without VCSQI. So it's very slight difference. So meaning that if you have a dominating group of hospitals, then the result is relatively stable, even if you remove off a, f uh, a, f a few dozen. And the 20 most important variables is very similar to the other ones on the other side. Okay. So here, so what we did with the 20, why is that important? So this is the same uh, confusion matrix as before. We just colorized this. So, and use that 20, to generate the next study. So if you click on that, if we use, oh, that's okay, that's fine. Don't worry about it. So if we use the top 20 only, so there's nothing else from the STS database considered to be a, a, a teaching data points, then the performance went down significantly. Went, actually, it's not that bad, but different. And if you use only the top 10, then next one, then you see, you don't see much difference at all. But even that one is not predictable if you see uh, the, the, the method when you have a predicted value is one and the actual is one is relatively low, uh, lower than above, but not much lower over there than on the complete set. So again, it represents a lot of opportunities and a lot, uh, even more challenges to figure out what to do and what, what kind of data points you're going to use. Does the direction of those variables matter? For example, if you matter at uh, high or low, I mean, that could be, it might be a U-shaped curve that where if you're you know, concentrated when you go into AKI, whereas if your matter is too low, you're volume overloaded. Does, 
how does it account for directionality, or does, or does that matter? It's interesting you picked this up because that was the first thing I, I run, that test, on the actual values. And there's basically no difference between the hemocrat uh, value for the readmitted patients and the non, uh, the patients who did not get readmitted. No stat and, and her statisticians did the same things. There's no difference. And still comes out very high as a matter of the most important. So we don't understand this. But again, we cannot control this until we get to the point where outcomes getting better and better and better. So we'll, we'll have to work on this uh, continuously. Next one. So this is the very early result. It's one single run of predicting cost. So here what you see is the predicted value on the y-axis and the actual cost on the bottom. And anything which below the, the yellow line is um, underestimated. Anything above is overestimated. Anything close to the, the bottom is really close to the actual result. So the reason is this spread, in my opinion, because of the different kind of cost categories, the cost RCC values for in different hospitals. So the next one, we run this well, one hospital, and you can see the result is much, much better because the cost ratio, the charge to cost ratio is stable for that particular hospital. So you can see the prediction values are much, much closer to the, the actual values. There are still outliers on the actual side, but very, very few outliers on the prediction value, prediction model. So that's interesting. We didn't have a chance to uh, study this more. We're going to run this for individual hospitals in, the, in BCSPI, and hopefully we can figure out how, uh, how to, what is the interpretation of that. We were thinking about running charge data to figure this out, because there is no involvement of RCC. So that's coming next. So you see how does it changes when you're looking at charge versus the prediction uh, to actual charges. You okay? Yeah. Just one thing. It looks like over $80,000. I'm sorry? Prediction falls off sort of against the... That over $80,000 would represent more complications, deviation. So, so yeah, yeah, the, listen. So, is that another way of using cost as a predictor to say that the whole algorithm dribbles off the court? And I don't know yet. I don't know yet. And right now, every single variable is uh, involved with this kind of prediction model. Now we have to start moving to do categorize the, the, the patients and see what's going on. But it contains the outcomes. So it, it is it, the system recognized as a patient that prone ventilation or reoperation or mortality or whatever. So is that what's the question or no? It seems like the limiting step here though is the volume of data is the amount of data. Why? I'm sorry. It's, it's the amount of data is one of the limiting factors. Is that here? In general with this proposition and within VCSQI, do we have enough volume of, of data points for this process to the iterative process to take place? That's a very, very important question. And my answer is probably we don't. But adding additional uh, data points, as my presentation said that in the, in the afternoon, if we add more, and that's the next slides, if we add more uh, data into the system, then you can see certain kind of data exchange with EMR, patient reported outcomes, imaging, like you guys doing with ECHO, and vital data combined with the actual outcomes and store it, and then we can have much better artificial intelligence reporting. More data about the, the individual patient rather than just more additive registries exactly. that are doing the same thing. Like if going to your first part of this presentation, this to work with all four states doesn't get us where we want to go. I don't think it's going to give us much more value and much more differentiator. But again, it's very early to say. But it also says that the, the, the other uh, really important things here, the clinical data, the structured data, 
and understanding each patient and each outcomes is critical to move in, to bring in data which is uh, unstructured and just random. Because we can tie this into a, a patient outcomes, the patient characteristics and the patient outcomes and procedure outcomes. So without that one, neither of them can do much, in my opinion. But more data, and uh, we would like to talk to some uh, sites here who would be interested to bring more data into this picture and analyze it totally differently. But the key is the structured data and uh, definitions and then and the outcomes, knowing the outcomes of each procedures in the BCS guy database. So I think that was it. And uh, I'm more than happy to answer any other questions. And uh, again, extremely early, but now we have an environment. We have three people working on this. Eddie, we can talk later if you would be uh, willing and, and uh, have time, or anybody else who would like to participate on giving us uh, some kind of input, data, most importantly, to, to do this much, much accurately and better. And also, directions. What is the more important here for you guys? I know that in looking through the top 20 reasons, and I take over the, yeah, I'll go back to that, is that uh, there's some of those we really haven't spent much time talking yes. about. You know, the BMI difference. we can't handle, but last the adequate, the, the no. OR duration, you know, initial, the, the hours ICU hours, the, the post-operative peak glucose, uh, some of these things are modifiable. Yeah. Patient age, you cannot do much about this. They want see, the last A1C level. It's interesting, surgical year is in there, so we, I think we should move this out. And um, discharge location is interesting, diabetic control is interesting. Uh, there are post-operative and intraoperative blood uh, confusion, I mean, uh, transfusion in there, and discharge location. But Maybe it, this is, the, the difference, the statistical, statistical difference among these are extremely, extremely small. So I wouldn't get hung up uh, too long about the, 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 the ranking and the, the list, because it's, it's really, really small percentage of difference among those. So almost identical, uh, equally important, all of them, based on this algorithm. It doesn't mean that it's always going to be the same. <clears throat> Those independent from each other? Yes. Uh, see, that was a very quick, wrong answer. I don't know, because we don't know what's going inside. There's, there's nothing what we can do about the algorithm. It's built by the machine. <clears throat> in, in terms of next steps, Jula, how, how would one go about you know training training an algorithm like this? Do you limit the, the patient population? you limit the variables that you feed in uh, to the that algorithm? That's a very, very strong, very, very difficult, but extremely good question. Again, this is uh, three days of work, and uh, we have to run this over and over again. One, is, one of these runs for that many patients takes roughly two hours on the Google environment. Now, we are in the process of talking to Google to give us a better machine without costing us more, but uh, we'll see how it changed <laughs> the equation. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, we don't know yet. We don't know. We know one thing, more data points needed and more unstructured data will need it to be much better of that yesterday. So what if we wanted, so we've been working with our engineering students at UVA to do like an intraoperative risk model. So we're, we have like every one minute blood pressures intraoperative. We're trying to get more and more and more data. Say if we wanted to work with you, how do we like HIPAA compliantly get you, do a data dump to you, get you We all already this? have an BAA with you. The entire environment is, is uh, working with, uh, all of your data is in the environment. So it's nothing new. They have all of EPIC? Not EPIC, no, but the, the surgical That's where this data. comes from, right? Okay. Yeah, but the surgical data is patient-specific. You are enormous customers, right? Because so your data is in our system. So... You already have an SBA in place. <laughs> you already have an SBA in place. Yeah, oh, it seems okay. like what you need, though, is in EPIC, not what they're entering right. into the... Mm -hmm. We need that, 
information which you talk about. Yeah. Exactly, the continuous, the, totally independent of any human interaction. Imaging, EKG, blood pressure, whatever. Stuff out of Epic is really hard sometimes. Uh, tell me. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it is cr critical for us to optimize this. Again, it is not a regression algorithm where you can change the, the coefficients and the change the values, give more weight and this and this and that. This is not like that. This is machine learning. More data, the machine learn better. That's what it is. The other thing that is, and, and uh, Dr. Spear, is that to, to make sure, we can probably pay attention to quality, data quality, and outliers, remove them, and see how does it improve the, 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 the results if we have more uh, reliable and better data altogether. So this was just a done altogether. But we wanted to see. And uh, I honestly tell you, I thought it's going to be much worse than that. <laughs> so it's not that bad if you're looking at the, if you look at the OE ratios, I, I almost forget. If you look at the OE ratios, you have two, three, is the right? which means that the result is three or four times worse than the prediction. That's exactly what you're seeing here. But we don't want to be that. We don't want to be there because you don't want to. I mean, we don't want to give you the patient have 66 percent chance to be readmitted. We want to say that the patient has solid evidence that is going to come to readmission, and then providing the evidence why is that. We had that um, inference tree. Is that very close to this kind of situation? So the inference tree, we run the inference tree thousands of times to figure out what is the most important element to predict values. We just don't have an inference tree for this at this point, but we will. <clears throat> when you start looking at predictive power, this is pretty well in line with what, what you see in terms of predicted readmission models uh, in the literature as well. Um, I'm wondering, I'll, I'll, I'll call on someone here, Scott, uh, from, from a biostatistician's <laughs> perspective, would you have any comments on that? Yes, yeah, Scott, come on. Yeah, you... Nobody ever needs a microphone here, man. Yeah, it's probably the only statistician in the room. Um, we don't know enough about these models. We don't know these are, are these univariate or these multivariate? Because I do this machine learning all the time. Yeah. And you have more than enough people. You have more than enough data. You may not have enough breadth of data per patient, but you have more than enough sample size. I know like that. If, yeah. if you do K-fold cross-validation, mm -hmm. you do any of the traditional machine learning techniques, um, the question is, is somebody asked you if these were independent. And I was shaking my head no, because you didn't run the models yes, exactly. in a univariate fashion and then expanded upon them. Yeah. So the, the last thing I would say is every model I've ever run for the VCSQI, you have to control for site. You have yeah. to run a hierarchical model okay. every time because the variation is yes. insane yeah. across yeah. the sites. Mm -hmm. So I would have your statisticians make sure that they export the ICC and compare that across models because that gives you a measure of how much variation the hospital What is the ICC, I'm sorry? The interclass correlation coefficient. Okay. Okay. And it's a percentage, and it basically tells you oh, yeah. 6.7 is being driven just by hospital alone. Oh, and okay. I find it's about 14% in every model I run. Okay. So you have to adjust for that 14%. That's why you get those big spikes. Okay. So that's all. So I'm happy to help in any way I can. That would be fantastic. Uh, so again, I'm even though we're not Armas customers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> that's some, not my fault. Some of us would like to be, but it's up to that guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. And again. Uh, <laughs> I know enough to be dangerous, that's all. I'm not a statistician, and this whole new era is just studying a lot to learn the language, and the, the, the terminologies, but we are extremely uh, enthusiastic about this. And, and I will it's, it's get back new. to it. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's very new, very new. All right. Other questions, comments from our ECSQI members? Mike, Mike, Mike. Hi. How about you? Did the, you were presenting. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I'm under. <laughs> okay, but you, you, you mentioned that you would like to have more data points. Yeah, I think it would be great to be able to have our hands on. I think it would be great to have our hands on that type of prediction model. I mean, this is pretty sophisticated. Be able to go back and, especially for me, we've got a renal issue, and be able to go back and take the top five things and see if that's an issue for us. Renal failure? Yeah, for us. Okay. I mean, admission's not an issue. Okay. Yeah, I think it's got great value. When, when will we see it? That's a good question. I, yeah, I, that is I, the $8 million dollar question. I would prefer, I would, uh, would like to have a much shorter session on the winter meeting in December to present some new uh, results to you guys. Maybe in the meantime we can make this part of our data review task force yeah. as well and, and present some of the preliminary results. Um, Here's a shameless pitch. If you're interested in participating in that group, please please let us know as well, because um, we will be looking at, at innovative pieces like this with mm -hmm. Joola over the next few months as well. Um, yeah. We'll look for an update in December. OK. Any other questions, comments, concerns? I would, I've been more than happy to do some uh, live data analytics, but this, this resolution would be absolutely meaningless. I'm sorry. That, prepared to have this. We'll send out the slides um, via our, our listserv and put them on the website. Um, and again, we will be happy to schedule calls or make this part of our uh, part of our task force work. Um, and you are all welcome to participate in this process. I will say we, we want to get CAF PCI in here as well in terms yeah. of our data. There's there's almost as many uh, patients in that data set as there are in, in yeah. our surgical database. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of patients and there's there's a lot of potential um, you know that we can learn. From, yeah. from processes like this. So with that, any other comments before we adjourn? Well, Jula, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. Thank you.